Now a discussion about the influence of common people in the American Revolution. This event's about an hour and a half. And on behalf of our Dean, Jerry Murphy, I'd be very happy to welcome you here tonight. Um, I'd also welcome you to pick up a flyer of the upcoming events that we have here. We will be finishing our forum season here on May 15th, uh, but next week we have Jean Trounstein, who is speaking about her new book, Shakespeare Behind Bars, and uh, showing excerpts, um, film excerpts from her prison students' performance of Merchant of Venice. And on Thursday of that week, we have Robert Torres, a uh, gay Puerto Rican educator who was the uh, narrator and subject of a really amazing film uh, called New York Rican Dream. And we will be showing that movie and uh, discussing the film with Robert Torres um, afterwards. And on May 7th, Mary Mazio, Carol Gilligan, and Mary Jo Kane, who's the University of Minnesota's director of the Tucker Center for Research on Girls and Women in Sports, will be here to show and talk about the Title IX film called A Hero for Daisy, uh, which is about the tenacious 1976 Yale women's rowing team. Uh, and Franz DeWall, a primatologist from Emory University, will be here to talk about the Ape and the Sushi, sushi Master. That has to be an all-time great title. On May 9th, and we end our forum season with Ray Kurzweil, uh, the inventor uh, extraordinaire and techie guy uh, an author of The Age of the Spiritual Machine, um, who's going to be in conversation with Howard Gardner, the multiple intelligences guru, and the two of them will be speaking about intelligence, computer, and human. So we would welcome you to any or all of those, and, um, but of course for tonight, we're uh, here to listen to and experience, and for those of you who know Howard, you know the informed word is experience, uh, both Howard Zinn and Ray Raphael. It's actually quite wonderful to have them here this week. Uh, both Howard and Ray are known for their social consciousness and their social activism, relic terms often associated with the 60s and the 70s. But this week, Harvard Yard has been the site of an extraordinary burst of social activism as Harvard students have taken over Memorial Hall to protest the failure of the university to pay some of its employees a living wage. I hope you'll indulge me as I quote from an open letter to the community from over a dozen housemasters as, as it appeared in the Crimson yesterday. We as housemasters recognize that the issue of a living wage affects the quality of our community life in the Harvard houses. In the houses, the living wage issue has a human face. The living wage campaign invites us to ask if we are doing as much as we can to assure that the workers in our communities are receiving adequate compensation for their work and their contributions to our daily lives. We appreciate the care and diligence of our students in bringing this issue of wages to the attention of the entire Harvard community in their work and written reports over the past two years. We have deep respect for their commitment to social and economic justice, and we support them in their commitments. And it has really been quite extraordinary to see how the Harvard community uh, has uh, really rallied solidly behind this issue. We could never in our wildest dreams have contrived such a meaningful welcome for Howard and Ray. Uh, two men committed to writing and teaching about history from the point of view of those who are often most neglected and ignored. Howard and Ray exercise what they call a bottom-up approach to examining new and critical perspectives on the American past and in doing so, they've created histories which resonate with all of us. Their histories tell stories. And through engaging us in the struggles of ordinary people, they give us connection, understanding, and insight to times and events which previously seemed lifeless and irrelevant. People of all colors from every class and economic level walk through their books. And in doing so, help us to understand not the extraordinary, but the ordinary events which cumulatively make up the fabric of this country. Howard Zinn is the series editor and inspiration for the New Press's People's History. He is a professor emeritus at Boston University, despite John Silver's best wishes, uh, and author of A People's History of the United States, the award-winning Declarations of Independence, Failure to Quit, 
as well as a recent memoir entitled, and another excellent title, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. He is also the author of the play Marx in Soho. Ray Raphael grew up in New York City, received his BA from Reed College and his MA from Berkeley. He then left academia to work in the peace and civil rights movements of the 60s before becoming part of the Back to the Land movement of the 70s, um, moving to the backwards, backwoods of Northern California, removed from electricity, telephone, and pavement. While living there, he taught in a one-room public high school teaching history, math, English, forestry, and physical education. Uh, he's a prolific writer. His works include An Everyday History of Somewhere, The Teacher's Voice, The Men from the Boys, Rites of Passage in Male America, and now A People's History of the American Revolution. Tonight, we'll begin with Howard Zinn, then move to Ray Raphael, and we will finally give you all a chance to ask your own questions. So thank you for coming. Howard. Thank you, Dottie Engler, for, for organizing this. I think you organized this. You're the one who always calls me. <laughs> so, uh, very happy to be here with Ray Raphael. We actually, yeah, we've done a couple of things before. We just did something in New York, and we did something, we were together in California. It's becoming a, a thing. And uh, I'm very glad Dottie has started off talking about what's going on uh, here, the, the, the students sitting in for a living wage, because y you're right, that's a, <laughs> if we're writing a history of Harvard University, we might leave them out, unless we were doing a people's history of Harvard University. And if we're doing a people's history of Harvard University, uh, then we would have them. And then we'd have the anti-war protesters of the 60s. And then we'd have the members of the John Reed Club. And we'd have all the people who were turned over to the FBI by Harvard University. Uh, now, maybe I'm exaggerating, but uh, <laughs> so, well, this, you know, there's some connection between Harvard University and the establishment. Uh, isn't there? <laughs> I think so. No? Uh, but, <laughs> no, no, of course not. Uh, but uh, I, I suppose I contrast this, you see, the, the sit-in, as, you know, a people's history, and I contrast that with the other Harvard, uh, and uh, the other Harvard is epitomized for me by walking to Widener Library and unless they have now removed it, but I doubt it. But then when you go up the stairs of Widener Library, you see this tribute to a soldier. And tribute to a soldier is good, except that well, there's a slogan that accompanies this tribute to a soldier. And there are different ways you can pay tribute to a soldier. And there's a way you pay tribute to a soldier which uh, is unsettling. And, and, and this tribute, at Harvard, it says, uh, happy is he who with one embrace clasps death and victory. Am I right? Do you remember that? Yeah. I didn't like that, <laughs> you see. Uh, and every time I went into Widener, yeah, that I was reminded of that. So anyway, it's good. these. People who, who are sitting in are reminding us of the invisible people. And that's the idea of a people's history. You know, that's what Ray uh, is doing in his People's History of the American Revolution. I'm not the co-author of that book. So, you know, right, some, some people think, you know, because my name appears, I have to make sure, even though I want to be the co-author of every good book, <laughs> but I'm not the co-author of that book. But the New Press, which is doing this series, you know, said to me, will you be general editor of the series of People's History series? And I thought, I don't want to be general editor of anything. And then they, because uh, I think of general editors being you know, one of these academic entrepreneurs, you know. No. Uh, but then they sent me Ray's book, and I read it, and I thought, wow. This is, I've, I've read a fair amount on the American Revolution. This is the best single book on the American Revolution that I've read. So happy to do this. 
So, yes, uh, uh, the, uh, and it's, there's a connection between the history of in, invisible people in the past and the story of invisible people in the present. That is the, the connection between, you know, the invisible people of the American Revolution and its time and the invisible people are in our time. And it's, it seems to me you can, you can go from one to the other. Th that is, by looking, into the, by looking at the present and being conscious of the people we don't notice in the present, you can then be induced to look into the past and say, hey, what are the, what are the counterparts of these people I know about today, the cleaning people and the, and the immigrants and the hard working people who overlooked, what is their counterpart in the past? And that leads you to a people's history of the past. That leads you to look for different things in the past than the kind of things you get in traditional textbooks. Or you can go the other way, you can go into history and, and read, read a, a, a book like Ray's or read other books that will tell you about Native Americans and women and black people and working people and African Americans and, and then ask yourself, what is their counterpart today? Uh, but in either way, a connection is made between the past and the present. Uh, and it's important to know that because there's no point going into the past if you're never going to come out of it. Uh, there's no point going to the past unless you're going to make a connection between what you learn about the past and what you see you know, in the present. Uh, I must tell you, uh, let's see, how I came to, this sounds very dramatic, <laughs> how I came to my present point of wisdom. Uh, I must tell you how I, how I came to uh, think of you know, doing people's history. Uh, uh, I was in the South. I was living in the South. I was teaching at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in Black Women's College. Became involved in the movement, uh, and then began became involved with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Began moving around the South, becoming a kind of writer participant in the movement. Went to Albany, Georgia, and Selma, Alabama, and wherever SNCC was doing things, wherever the movement was engaged and going into towns in Mississippi and Jackson and Greenwood and Greenville and Hattiesburg and so on. And uh, it occurred to me, the things I was seeing, I know were not being recorded anywhere. They're not becoming part of anyone's history. Oh, well, sure, I was reading in the papers about what the heads of the NAACP were saying and what the latest legal struggles were, you know, on the level of courts and, you know, and what possible legislation there might be in Congress and what the president might be saying. But the things that I was seeing on the ground level were not becoming part of history. And so I, I wrote a letter to Columbia University, my alma mater, although I, I don't have a maternal or paternal relationship, <laughs> you know, but you know, it's, let's put it this way, I went to Columbia University. <laughs> And I, that's where I got my doctorate. That's where I did my graduate work. And I kn knew they had an oral history project, which was new at that time. Now oral history is known. That time, oral history was new. There was no Studs Terkel around then. Well, he was around, but he wasn't doing those things. And oral history project. And I had, in fact, done some work in the Columbia University oral history project. And I knew what the oral history project consisted of. It consisted of somebody interviewing ex-secretaries of state ex-generals, ex-admirals, ex-almost everybody who was important in the higher echelons of government and industry, you know, and, you know, trying to catch them before they died. And that's the trick of oral history. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, uh, you, know you, you follow the health reports and you interview people who are about to go and you get them at the right moment. So I knew that's what the Oral History Project consisted of. And so I wrote to Columbia University, I wrote to the Oral History Project, and I said, hey, well, I didn't start off that way, because <laughs> you don't write that way to Columbia University. But I said, there's terrific oral history to be done down here. I mean, come down, send somebody down here with tape recorders. Tape the people in Albany, Georgia, 
who's been demonstrating, I mean, who knows what's happening in Albany, Georgia. Take these people who've just come out of jail in Albany, Georgia. Well, a good part of the black population in Albany, Georgia has been in jail. Talk to them. Go to Selma, Alabama. Take the Selma Freedom Chorus and a church rally that takes place before the people are going out to try to register to vote in Selma. You know, go to Greenwood, Mississippi. Talk to Mrs. Ruby Pilcher, who uh, lives next door to the Freedom House set up by the SNCC workers and who brings them food and takes care of them. And talk to her about her life. And, and you know, that's oral history. I got this letter back from Columbia University. That's a wonderful idea. When somebody starts off that way, you get very suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful idea, you know, it's like <laughs> Gandhi said about Western civilization, a great idea. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know uh, 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 one, yeah. But we don't have the resources. We don't have the resources. Columbia University doesn't have the resources to do that. It's like Harvard University doesn't have the resources to pay a living wage to its workers, right? The, none of these people, you know, it's, it's like, you know, really, it's like the, you know, it's always that way. I mean, the people with the most resources don't have the resources. You know, the, the United, the richest country in the world doesn't have the resources to take care of the health needs of 40 million people. You know, it's, that's, that's the story on every possible level. They don't have the resources. But what it really means is they don't have the interest. It means they don't care. Uh, that's what it really means. Uh, it means that uh, they don't need these people. They don't need to represent these invisible people uh, uh, because we're represented. We're represented by the Secretary of State. You know, we're represented by the people up on high. They're the, they're the ones who take care of things. And so, you know, we don't, we don't need these voices. Uh, that's the idea. And the, pr the premise of this is that uh, this is one big family, this country. <laughs> and uh, we all have a common interest. So that, therefore, the people who are on top, they can represent everybody. Uh, we aren't divided by class and race and sex and this and that, no. It's as the Constitution begins, the preamble of the Constitution begins, we the people of the United States Right? That's all of us got together in Philadelphia. Those 55 rich white men who got together in Philadelphia, this wonderful multicultural group, got together in Philadelphia and we, the people of the United States, you know. No. So they, yeah, they think, yeah, we're all one and therefore we can be represented by the people with money and power. And so, that, in fact, we have the language to, to, uh, exemplify that we have, the, you know, the national interest. Uh, shall we do this? Shall we go here? Shall we send troops there? Shall we bomb here? Well, if it's in the national interest, <laughs> in whose interest? <laughs> there is no national. In there's no single entity. There's no uh, what Kurt Vonnegut spoke of a, a, a grand faloon. Some of you may remember a grand faloon is this sort of. Uh, something which is sort of encompasses everything, pretends to encompass everything, you see, but it really, it can't, you know, it's a great big bubble, you see, and which is artificial, which needs to be punctured by the truth in order to reveal the complexities inside, in order to reveal the different interests that are inside this bubble, and there are different interests in America. Uh, and so there's no such thing as the national interest, national defense, national security. Or is it somebody's securities? That's, you know, closer to it. Uh, but but that's, the, that's the pretense, you know, that we have this, this, all this common interest. And no recognition of the fact that we are uh, a class society, uh, have always been. And you, well, you'll read about the revolutionary period, and I mean, that's one of the things that, that Ray brings out in his book, but, but uh, I mean, this is true all through American his, history. You, can, uh, you could write a history of the United States, an overview of history of the United States, and start off with a sentence, the history of the United States is a history of class struggle. <laughs> well, that would be a dangerous way to start off. It would be hard to get a publisher. <laughs> 
a mainstream, certainly a mainstream publisher to, to do a history of the United States. But the truth is that, yes, uh, we were a society riven by class right from the very beginning, riven by race, riven by, right from the beginning. It's not that you know, we were all pilgrims, you know, coming here dressed in those funny costumes, sharing everything, writing the Mayflower Confab. I remember all that stuff given. No, no. There was us, and there were the Native Americans. There were the blacks and, and slaves, and there were the slaveholders, there were the servants, there were the masters, there were the people given huge grants of land, you know, huge, huge grants of land. Other people, no land at all, propertyless people from the beginning and, and up all through American history. You know, I mean, James Madison recognized this when he was writing in the Federalist Papers and he was trying to persuade people to ratify the Constitution. He said, well, we need a government. We need a strong government. Why do we need a strong government? Because, well, there, there's conflict. <laughs> we, he, there, society is divided into factions. Federalist number 10, right? Uh, society is divided into factions. Uh, based on what? Some people have property, some people don't have property. Uh, there's going to be conflict. We've got to do something about controlling this conflict. We have this nice, new, strong government. Uh, it will help to control this conflict. He was very aware, as were all the founding fathers, as were all those people who gathered together for the very conscious of the rebellions that had just taken place after the revolution. Uh, just Shays' Rebellion being the most recent one, just before. Uh, there's, a, there's an important a conjunction between the Shays Rebellion of 1786 and the, and the framing of the Constitution in 1787 because the framers of the Constitution were very conscious of the fact that out in western Massachusetts thousands of farmers had gathered and rebelled against the elite of Boston against the high taxes that they had to pay and they had surrounded courthouses and they had prevented the court proceedings from going on. This was a real rebellion and there were similar rebellions in other parts of the country in Virginia, in Pennsylvania, uh, in New Jersey, similar rebellion. And were, the founding fathers were conscious of this. And one of them, one of the Washington's generals, General Knox, uh, uh, wrote to him after Shays' rebellion and said, hey, I, I always think these guys start off that way, but they, <laughs> no, they, they, no, they very elegant writers, those. And, and, but in effect, in effect, he said, uh, he said, these people uh, in Shays' Rebellion, many of them veterans, you know, veterans of the Revolutionary War, Captain Daniel Shays himself a veteran. Many of these people are veterans of the Revolutionary War. They come back and they find that all those promises, oh, how universal a story this is, of veterans being given promises that if they fight and sacrifice that they will come back and there will be a new world and so on. And, uh, and, and Knox writes to Washington, so these people fought in the Revolution. They think because they fought in the Revolution that uh, now the fruits, the wealth of this country uh, belongs equally to them. Well, this is dangerous. And so uh, a government is set up which is going to try to control uh, rebellion. I mean, that's, that was the, the idea of the Constitution. The idea of the Constitution was not as even some, you know, very prominent historians that, oh, they wanted to, these are very wise, they were smart men, eloquent men, and so on. But the, the myth is that they, their idea was to set up a democratic society and, you know, liberty and justice. And No, that was not. The intent was to set up a government that would be able to control things, be able to deal with Indians uh, uh, as the settlers moved out west, be able to deal with the slave rebellions, be able to deal with working people who rebelled. That, that was the I idea of it. So. Well, that, and so, in fact, a government was set up that was able to deal with that and has been able to deal with that ever since. Because ever since then, we've had a government and legislation that was represented a particular class of Americans. It didn't represent the poor and didn't represent the black and didn't represent the immigrants and didn't represent the Native Americans. The history of legislation in this country from that point to this point has been a history of legislation to benefit a very small group of people. There have been a few departures from that when, when at a time when there were great social movements that, that forced, you might say, pressured for departures from that in the 1930s and the New Deal and the 1960s with those movements and so on. But by and large, you know, that has been the story. And a history, a society 
uh, divided uh, by, by class and race and, and so on. <coughs> and uh, so <coughs> it's I'm looking at the clock because, you know, we have a deal. <laughs> I'm a very disciplined person. Uh, listen to orders. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the people who run these things are very tough. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't be deceived by their appearance. You know. uh, but, um, but the... Uh, and so the history, when, when you have a society divided this way, history is going to reflect those conflicts and those divisions. It's, it's, uh, it can't be a, a neutral history, a history of which, oh, the history represents everybody. History is going to be written from a, a point of view. Uh, and some people are going to be left out, and some people are going to be given prominent uh, attention. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so you, well, it's, it's in, when you think about, when you think about doing history or writing, a, presenting history, it's inevitable, right? That, that you have an enormous mass of data. And inevitably, you must choose from that enormous mass of data what you are going to present in, in, in when you write history or when you teach history. And you choose according to what you think is important. That is, you choose according to your point of view. And depending on where you are and where you sit and or who you're trying to please, uh, you will have a different notion uh, you know, of what you know, is important. Uh, and so, uh, but if you look at it from the point of view of people who have been generally left out of the dominant landscape of American history, uh, things look different. You know. The American Revolution looks different from the point of view of Indians. The Jacksonian period, I remember, was taught to us as Jacksonian democracy. Those, those words always went together. Jacksonian democracy. Jackson was a slaveholder. Jackson was a racist. Jackson was an Indian killer. And in the period of Jacksonian democracy, the, uh, uh, the industries were beginning in New England, and girls were going to work at the age of 12 and dying at the age of 25, and, and you know, in this period of Jacksonian democracy. And also, this was a period in which the, the, the army of the United States under with Jackson's orders, with driving the Indians of the southeast out of their homes across the Mississippi, the Trail of Tears, 4,000 out of 16,000 die in the Trail of Tears. This was Jacksonian democracy. So looking at Jacksonian democracy from different points of view, uh, the, the, you have to separate those two words. Uh, you look at, the, uh, look at the Civil War from the standpoint of, of Indians. The Civil War is a war for liberation of slaves. Yes, and in fact, th you know, there's a kind of emancipation that takes place uh, as a result of the Civil War. And yet, during the Civil War, while armies were fighting the Confederates in various parts of, of the country, uh, other parts of the army were out west annihilating Indian tribes. More land was taken away from Indians during the years of the Civil War than in any comparable period in American history. So yes, if you look at the Civil War from a different point of view, you know, yeah, it becomes something else. The Industrial Revolution, the great economic miracle of the United States. Uh, and I remember sitting there in class and marveling at, wow, that's when we became a great economic power. And, and we're, taught to take, we're taught to take pride in, you know, the wealth of Carnegie, <laughs> or the achievements of the great, you know, and in the, you know, how many steel ingots were produced, you know, and how many r miles of railroad track were laid, and, you know, it's all us, it's all us. Uh, yeah, our interests are the same, you see. And, uh, but from the point of view of the people who worked in Rockefeller's oil refineries, the people who worked in you know, the Chinese and Irish immigrants who worked on the Transcontinental Railroad, you know, from the standpoint that people worked in Carnegie Steel Mills, you no, know, it wasn't simply uh, a great economic miracle, you know. And uh, there was a human cost to economic progress, which is not much dealt with in the traditional histories of, you know, the, that, that great period of industrial expansion between the Civil War and World War I. Uh, 
So, uh, yes, yeah, so different, different points of view depending on, uh, well, take the progressive, so-called progressive era in American history. I say so-called, it wasn't <laughs> so-called. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, progressive ear. Why? Some reforms were passed. Roosevelt was president. Uh, progressive ear is exactly that period in which more black people were lynched in this country than any other period. You know, uh, Roosevelt, the great progressive. Roosevelt, uh, you know, there he is on Mount Rushmore. Uh, a warmonger, <laughs> a militarist, a lover of war, a man who who observes a, a massacre taking place in the Philippines. Uh, while he's president and congratulates the, the, mili the general who orders the massacre of 600 uh, Philippine men, women, and children. And, but you know, our heroes, when you look at it, depending on your point of view, the heroes are different. You know, it's no longer Theodore Roosevelt. It's, it's, uh, it's Emma Goldman and Mother Jones, you know, and Helen Keller and uh, Eugene Debs. You know, and uh, Frederick Douglass and W. B. Du Bois. You know, you just get different heroes depending on your point of view. And uh, I, uh, I have a f I have a few more minutes. <laughs> I, d I just want to assure the people who are threatening me <laughs> that I have a few more minutes. <laughs> you see, and uh, but I guess the the. the one thing I want to say, ignore all the other things I was saying. <laughs> all, well, preface, it's all. Uh, the one thing I want to say is that this, this approach to history, uh, this presenting of history from the standpoint of what do our leaders do, you know, uh, what is Congress, you know, telling the story of America from the standpoint of what are the statutes passed by Congress and what are decisions made by the S Supreme Court and what are the edicts, you know, uh, by the presidents and so on, and, and, uh, and who are the military heroes that we should erect statues to? Well, this approach is a profoundly undemocratic one. And we're presumably a democratic country, but that's a profoundly undemocratic approach to history, the leaving out of the point of view of uh, people who, who are, yes, invisible, who don't have power. Uh, and, uh, uh, and what it does, that kind of history, it creates a passive citizenry. It creates a citizenry that believes that the important things that are done are done by important people. And that all that is left for us to do, all that's left for citizens to do, is to engage in the most puny act of citizenship, and that is to vote. Really, because all we have to do is vote for these, you know, we have a choice. What a choice we always have. <laughs> but to vote, that's, our, that's, our, that's the pinnacle of citizenship in this supposedly democratic country to vote for A or B, or A or A prime, you see. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but in fact, the his history of the country shows that when important gains were made in, in justice, in economic justice or racial justice, or the uh, attention paid to problems of women and the existence of women, when, when whenever progress was made it was not made through the initiative of people on top. It was made by citizens, by people uh, getting together, by organizing, by the labor organizing, by anti-war people organizing, by women organizing, by disabled people organizing, by gay and lesbian people. Or, uh, that's, when, that's when things change. It's important to know that so that you don't remain a passive citizen uh, and so that you, you understand that we all, we all have a, a role to play. It seems to me that that is the importance of, of people's history. And that's why I'm so glad that uh, Ray Raphael has done his book. And now he's going to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. So Howard said that the people who give the orders uh, around here, and of course he was the one to receive them, so uh, he told me, uh, he says, when I introduce you, I want to come. I want you to come. Okay, so uh, he, can, he can give a few orders too. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about uh, writing common people into history, why we do it, what we can learn from it, 
uh, why it's so seldom done, what are some of the obstacles we face. The obstacles, let me give you an example of the obstacles we face. I moved out to California in the 1960s, and I met many people from the 1960s California style. A lot of these people believed in past lives. And the ones who believed in past lives, it's phenomenal how many people during the Middle Ages had been princes and princesses. <laughs> Very few peasants in those times. It was a reverse kind of social pyramid. So this is what we face. Uh, this is what we're up against. This actually goes quite profoundly deep in our society, in our consciousness. Um, what, uh, common people, that's my focus. First, let me define that, common people. Um, you have to watch out with people, the term people, because it's really that, that term can really be mustered from the left or the right or even the center in its behalf. The center, I'm referring to the will of the American people uttered by ultra-privileged male politicians in this last election a uh, little too often for my liking. So I'm going to define common people, very simple definition, as those who do not enjoy the special privileges of wealth, prestige, or political power or alternately, if you prefer, uh, all those whom Alexander Hamilton warned us against. <laughs> so um, why do we study common people? Okay, there's, uh, there's really several levels of it. First, on the most basic level, it's a question of just simple social justice, uh, giving equal air time, give credit where credit's due. Beyond that, what's really more important is it's through history that we learn how to interpret the political process through the study of history. For years in school, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, so on, until you're about a senior, you learn history before you learn how our present political process is supposed to work. And in history, then, if you study the workings of the, from basically top-down history of the elite, that's the way you just come to imagine that's what politics is. That's the way history works, politics works, since it worked then. We can marginalize people in the past, therefore we can marginalize people in the present. So there's a whole political message there. Then beyond that, from the historian's point of view, you want to study common people just for the sake of accuracy. You leave out too much when you don't. Imagine a history of the Depression that basically is a study of FDR. Now, th this is, you know, the comparable, if you go back to the Revolution, we have those things. We have histories of the Revolution, which are basically a study not of FDR, but of his counterparts. And they call that a history of the Revolution. Well, uh, it leaves out too much. Let me give you an idea of some of the things that it leaves out uh, that I cover in my book. In, well, what, what I do in my book, I take my lens, my focusing lens, and I switch from George Washington over here about 90 degrees and come over to his slaves, his, uh, the Indians whom he displaced, the soldiers whom he commanded in the army, their wives, their mothers, the, uh, the women who followed the army, all these other people. So let's look at some of these other people, the slaves. About one in every five slaves in the South ran to the British for their freedom during the Revolutionary War. This included 17 of Washington's own slaves, 30 of Jefferson's own slaves. And uh, this was really a, an exodus of biblical proportions, really greater than the more famous Underground Railroad that followed. So huge consequences here. Uh, it was, uh, I guess Howard and I have an argument as to whether the Civil War or the Revolutionary War was the largest Indian War in our nation's history. Uh, but uh, it's certainly, it's uh, what we, you, you think of Indian wars as, you know, okay, the whites going out and after the Indians. And it's much more complex than that. In the Revolutionary War, every single Native American east of the Mississippi was directly affected by the Revolutionary War. Most of them sided one way or the other, uh, and most of them sided with the losing side, namely the British. This opened up all the lands, and, uh, and they suffered the consequences. Uh, it was really the, the largest war, Indian War, in the nation's history. The, um, even the very beginning of the war, most people, everybody really agrees that the beginning of the, Re the American Revolution started in Lexington and Concord, shot heard around the world, Paul Revere and all that. That's April 19th, 1775. The previous summer, 1774, there were in every county seat throughout rural Massachusetts, Thousands upon thousands of farmers went to the courthouses, dragged out every British appointed official, deposed them, dragged them out into the streets or into, onto the commons where they'd have to run the gauntlet. Uh, they, they made them take off their hats and recite their resignations between maybe three, four to six thousand people 
uh, lined up on each side. Once was not enough. They had to do it over and over and over. They didn't have microphones, and all the people wanted to hear. At every juncture during these proceedings, the people would take votes. Was that the resignation sufficient? Maybe he should change it. This amazing, amazing outpouring. By the end of it, you have the no zero British presence in the Massachusetts countryside, 1774, eight months before. What happens eight months later, the British try to reconquer a land they had already lost, and that is the counter-revolution, which for all these years has masqueraded as the revolution, the beginning of the revolution. Phenomenal discovery. It's like the emperor's new clothes. Why don't people see that? Because we're locked into certain myths. We get those myths by too narrow a focus. If you just look at what the farmers were doing during that time, you see what's happening. You go on and on like this. Uh, all these people are seeking freedom. The slaves, the, uh, the farmers, the Indians, they're all seeking their own version of freedom. It's not just the taxation without representation people. Um, a lot of the loyalists were seeking their freedom. You have in Maryland, Delaware, Hudson Valley, New York, southern backcountry, you have loyalists who are rebelling against the elite, the patriot elite. The, the, the elite were patriots in those areas. These people become loyalists, and they fight for the loyalists for their freedom, lower class tenant farmers. So um, pacifists, they're fighting for their freedom a whole different way. One in 30 free Americans during the revolutionary time belonged to a religious pacifistic organization which opposed all war in this one in particular. Uh, they had to face the power of a very oppressive government which, which was going at them. They wanted their money, they wanted their bodies, and they wanted them to take oaths. These people wouldn't do it. A lot of them landed in jail. So th there's a whole story in that. Um, women, we, uh, a lot of us know that uh, women gave up tea and, and fancy ornaments for the sake of the revolution. Well, some women gave up fancy tea, I mean fancy ornaments and tea, those who could afford it. Tea was an upper class thing at that time. A lot of other women uh, behaved quite differently. You had the lower class women, many of them joined the Continental Army, basically. They had nowhere else to go. These were basically homeless people and they became camp followers. Other women uh, rioted for against uh, war profiteers for lower prices. You have a whole other level of involvement here. When you look at the revolution from the standpoint of class, too, you find out that, that it was really, in 1775, there was a massive outpouring of all classes, virtually all classes, except at the very top, uh, of people against the British. Uh, by, the, uh, by the end of that year, most people with any form of property, whether that was a shop or a farm, they went home to tend to that property. There was nobody left except poor people. They had to resort to a draft. So in this draft, if you, you could simply, if you didn't want to go, you'd be drafted, your number was called, you simply pay 20 bucks, you get a substitute. It's an easy way out if you have the money. So by the end of the war, you have an absolutely, uh, an army which is absolutely class, class driven, lower class only, except of course for the officers, and impressionable young boys. That's who won the Revolutionary War. This is all, all by class. Now uh, these are amazing. This is not the simple story. This is not the, the kind of the, the one-dimensional morality tale that we're raised with. And we're getting all this just by, all we have to do is look at the common people and all this just emerges. We, can, we, can, we, can, we, we find all this. These are not really that controversial if you just look there. So why aren't we looking there? That's the big question I want to address now. What, what are the impediments to looking at people's history? Why, why don't we do it? Um, first of all, there's the need for, to mythologize. I mean, all cultures have have to create some kind of sort of founding mythology, why they came to be who they are, and implicitly that's a justification of who, of who they are. So we've done that. We've created our, our founding myth. And in that myth, we have our heroes. And these heroes are kind of embody all the things that we supposedly want, all the virtues and the values uh, that we aspire to. Then added to this, we have the natural human inclination uh, to identify with somebody. So hi history kind of calls out for protagonist. It, it needs that one individual, the, the, the single person who embodies the attributes of the many. So we have George Washington is courageous. Meanwhile, there's 10,000 other men who are waking up, about to go into battle and having to face that battle, knowing they might die. And what do we learn? We learn George Washington is courageous. It's kind of a shorthand for the other people, and then the other people, you know, drift, drift uh, you know, the, through history, just kind of will get left out of that, of that telling uh, through this process. We have Washington marched against Cornwallis at, at Yorktown. I love that one, Washington marched, because Washington didn't march. <laughs> Washington war, rode a horse. Uh, actually, he wore, I think, according to Groucho Marx, he rode a white horse. Um, 
I learned that because it was the only question I could answer at the end of his show, what was the color of George Washington's white horse. <laughs> so he did make things easy because I was kind of young <laughs> at that time. There was also one about Grant's tomb, but anyway. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, so Washington is marching in this kind of grand single combat against Cornwallis. This, this kind of like leader down, uh, uh, this top down, it's, it's really, kind of, it's trickle downs. You know trickle down economics? Okay, this is trickle down history. Uh, the historians don't call it trickle down history. They don't give, you know, that's not the official school of historians. We are this historians. Because Howard and I believe we come from a school. We're kind of the school of people historians. And they don't say we're from the school of trickle down historians. Uh, but they do say, but, they, but there's another related word, it's called dissemination. And the way dissemination works is uh, a few people have these great ideas. These are great thinkers and visionaries and wonderful people who generally do tend to be quite well off and a lot of time to think about these things. And, and they, uh, they envision something and then it happens. So, um, it, you know, so you have like the, in the revolutionary period, these great men conceptualize the revolution and others uh, follow. They just fall into, fall into line, okay? Uh, you have a few men kind of like writing the play and the rest are just delivering the script. The, these, these top people, they're called leaders. Think of what that means. Uh, you, you hear leaders, leaders. What does that mean? You see, even, at, even out here on, on, the, on your protest, there'll probably be like, you know, uh, rebel leaders or whatever, you know, spoke, you know, leaders, okay? So now, if they're leaders, who's everybody else? It's a follower, right? I mean, that's the only way, you know, in a multiple choice test, leaders, opposite, followers, choose number A and you're right. Okay, so you have leaders and followers. What does that do? That means these people are just like following along. It's, it's a way of belittling their very real concerns. So uh, if you're against any kind of social movement, you have a, a great vested interest in calling people leaders. This is the way it works. This is the way, and this is the way we, this is kind of in the, in the sort of uh, underlying grammar of the way most history is told from the standpoint of leaders. By the way, I have a very sad tale to tell about this, uh, which is my first review. My first review was Kirk's review, and it said, started out, uh, People's History of the American Revolution, How Common People Shaped the Fight for Independence. This is the story of slaves, women, rebel leaders, etc. What do I have to do to get through? My very first review, rebel leaders. You know, this is not the story of rebel leaders, by the way. Uh, it's not my intent. Okay. Uh, these great people, th there's, a, there's a whole concept of how history works. It's not, you know, there's much more dynamic... Uh, flow between so-called leaders and followers. It doesn't work uh, from the top down just like that. Let me give you an example, uh, Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, one of the great documents of our time, right? Conceived by a mighty genius, Thomas Jefferson. Well, it's a great document, yes, and it says many great things. So were, the, so were the several other documents which preceded it on a local level, uh, which had many of the same words, which were made by little county committees and conventions and so on. Uh, which drafted these things, and Jefferson had at his disposal, and he made it, he did a marvelous job of synthesizing all these lesser known works and coming up with a document that then he is then credited with. And that's kind of a, a good model for the way that the kind of the process of leaders and followers. You actually have a groundswell of support doing a lot of the work, one person kind of putting it together in some way and then getting all the credit is, is kind of like, you know, just uh, spun out of his mind uh, in some kind of sort of immaculate conception sort of way. Okay. Um, so anyway, we're facing, this, this is what we're faced uh, with, all, the, all these sorts of things. Now, in people's history, we also, um, a lot of this is, by the way, consciously manipulated uh, to, to create, um, to, to lead away from the people, to create these special people on top. Let me read you a little section here. Uh, this is a direct quote from Charles Thompson. Uh, he's the Secretary of the Congress. I could not tell, the Continental Congress, that is, I could not tell the truth without giving great offense. Let the world admire our patriots and heroes, their supposed talents and virtues, where they were so, by commanding imita imitation will serve the cause of patriotism in our country. Okay, so he's very consciously creating this, this kind of image of heroes, and he doesn't want to burst the bubble. And so, of course, at the end of his life, he actually burns his papers, so we do not have, you know, what it, whatever it was inside that bubble. Uh, you know, we, we don't know what it was. Uh, but we do get that idea. A lot of this stuff, if we just take a, a self-conscious approach uh, to try to overcome it, we can. For instance, this marching, uh, Washington March business. Uh, in, in people's history, I have, um, 
I tell the military story of the war. I, tell, I give a narrative. This actually is a narrative history. It's not kind of a haranguing history or you know, arguing points. This is a narrative. It tells stories, a myriad of stories. As a matter of fact, if you look at the index here and you see all the people in there, you're not going to recognize any. These are all stories about common people. But it is storytelling. So when I come to the military history, I tell the story through five common soldiers who were at, at, uh, at the various battles. And that's the way, that's the way I weave the tale. Okay? So, um, so it, can, it can be done, but you have to be very conscious about it. Even so, here's the biggest problem we face, uh, which is more than just a problem of attitude. It's at a very concrete physical problem that has to be addressed. And that's the problem of sources. Where do you get sources for slaves, for Indians, for tenant farmers who don't write, and so on? A lot of common people, particularly as we go back in time, uh, they didn't write. Even if they did write, or could write, they don't have quite have the, the leisure or the kind of um, venue in which to write. Their, their letters aren't going to be preserved in, sa uh, in secure family structures, nice libraries passed on generation to generation. Uh, so you have to overcome that. How do you do it? First of all, you, do, you look for what is there. And sometimes you get a little lucky. Out of, out of um, half a million slaves in the United States at that time, there were two complete narratives. I mean, by complete, I mean only about 20 pages long or something about their experiences during that time. These were people who did flee to the British. They were preachers. So they, they basically wrote their memoirs uh, in religious journals that were published during that time. So we're lucky. We do have those two stories. Then you have a few pension applications uh, later on. But um, then, oh, here's another one, they, uh, an Iroquois warrior named Blacksnake. This is really one of my favorites. He wrote a, he didn't know how to write, but a friend of his learned a little English. And so he knew how to write. So Blacksnake dictated to his friend his memoir. And it's just fascinating stuff. I include a bunch of it in here. Incredible stories uh, such as, we get an inside look about when the British are trying to uh, basically convince the Iroquois warriors to join their side. And you get, and he narrates the entire argument, the debate within circles between the hawks and the doves. And then he also talks about uh, what it's like to be, to be part of a slaughter, what it likes to be on a massacre, kind of both ends. Incredible document. So you do get some of this. Some, uh, one, one great uh, memoir which is published, I include some of it in the book, but a fuller version is the, the Shoemaker, George Robert Twelves Hughes, which is a book that you, several of you might be familiar with. Um, then you have a few, a few soldiers did leave letters and, and, mem and later memoirs. When the things that you learn from, the, from these firsthand pieces, let me read you one, because this, this is um, really in a nutshell shows you how much you can learn from a very personal document. This is actually a pension, a pension application. This, this guy is applying for a pension after the war. What's beautiful about this is you didn't have to know how to write. They would, this was oral history. They would actually, if you were applying for a pension, you would go and they would take down your story. So a lot of time it says, deponent says this, deponent says that. It was really a first person kind of thing. Uh, here we have, this guy is in the South, and uh, this, is, this is a story he tells. His name is Moses Hall. The evening after our battle with the Tories, we having a considerable number of prisoners, I recollect a scene which made a lasting impression upon my mind. I was invited by some of my comrades to go and see some of the prisoners. We went to where six were standing together, some discussion taking place. I heard some of our men cry out, remember Buford. This was a site uh, where the Tories massacred the, um, uh, the Patriot prisoners. And the prisoners were immediately hewed to pieces with broadswords in revenge for Buford. At first I bore the scene without any emotion, but upon a moment's reflection I felt such horror as I never did before nor have since, and returning to my quarters and throwing myself upon my blanket, I contemplated the cruelties of war until overcome and unmanned by a distressing gloom from which I was not relieved until commencing our march next morning before day by moonlight." So he's, he's, uh, he's sensitive to the, to the uh, tragedies of war. But later the next day, being on the left side of the road as we marched along, I discovered lying upon the ground something with appearance of a man. Upon approaching him, he proved to be a youth about 16, who, having come out to view the British through curiosity, for fear he might give information to our troops, they had run him through with a bayonet and left him for dead. Though able to speak, he was mortally wounded. The sight of this unoffending boy, butchered, 
relieved me of my distressful feeling for the slaughter of the Tories, and I desired nothing so much as the opportunity of participating in their destruction. So you have this very sensitive guy who doesn't want to do this, and this, this kind of, uh, he, gets, he gets into it. This, is, this, in a nutshell, is war, this kind of you know, strange, twisted logic of revenge. So a lot of these, uh, when you can find the sources, take them. And, and basically, in the people's history, I've combed far and wide for every available direct source, and, and it's in there. Uh, in part and fully referenced uh, for you to find the rest. Okay, beyond that though, um, you, have to use, you have to be more creative. I use a trick I call reflected images. We have the, the documents of the elite, multi-volumes of them. Uh, they're sti they still don't have Washington's all completed. They've been working on it for decades now, this, the new version of Washington's. Um, so what, um, by looking at these things, you can get glimpses of how, of, of, of the of the life for the common people. For instance, 1777, July 4th, this is the first anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Washington's general orders, no women shall ride in the wagons. What's he talking about? Uh, what's he talking about is the women camp followers are riding in the wagons. He doesn't like that because he wants the wagons to be for the men so they'll save their energy. We, uh, a month later, absolutely no women ride in the wagons. <laughs> Two months later, if any women ride in the wagon, uh, the men will be punished, and so on. They'll be they're dismissed from the truce. He goes on, he keeps escalating the punishment. This goes on for four years, uh, and <laughs> until we find out from the one, one uh, direct source from a camp follower at Yorktown that she arrived at Yorktown riding in a wagon. <laughs> uh, so what do we learn? We learned that the women rode in the wagons. We learned that the, the men appreciated what they were doing. They had a, you know, they were into it. We learned that the men disobeyed orders whenever they wanted, pretty much. So we learn all sorts of things um, from these indirect, indirect sources, reflect imi reflected images, I call them. Um, one of the most incredible reflected images really comes from uh, runaway slave ads. As I said, there are very few direct statements from slaves, but consider this. Now, as I read this, try to figure out what you can surmise by the slave owner, the slave in question, and the nature of slavery. All of this is very, there's a lot to be said. This is happening, this runaway slave ad appears really right when Lord Dunmore is issuing, uh, the British governor of Virginia is issuing his proclamation freeing the slaves if they run to the British. Absented himself from the subscriber, the fourth of this instant, a Negro man named Limus. He is of yellow complexion and has the ends of three of his fingers cut off his left hand. He is well known in Charleston from his saucy and impudent tongue, of which I had, had many complaints. Therefore, I hereby give free liberty and will also be much obliged to any person to flog him so as not to take his life in such manner as they shall think proper whenever he is found out of my habitation without a ticket. For though he is my property, he has the audacity to tell me he will be free that he will serve no man, and that he will be conquered or governed by no man. I forewarn masters of vessels from carrying him off the province." So, I mean, that's a whole textbook in the nature of slavery right there. Sometimes we don't even have that to go on. We don't even have reflected images, okay? But we can still make statements. Let's continue with the slavery theme. By the way, I'm focusing maybe more on slavery now, but I also deal with, uh, with a, a full range. I have a, a slavery, all the Native American <laughs> groups east of the Mississippi are covered in here with complete narratives. Loyalists, pacifists, women of all classes, the boys who did the fighting and so on. Uh, but I'm focusing on slavery here. These people did run to the British. Okay, we know that. What we don't know is how they made that decision. But about a fifth of them did, four fifths did not. It was a very dangerous task. I mean, a lot of them died. Um, as a matter of fact, about as many people died trying to find their freedom in the British as white soldiers died in the war. Um, they died from um, being caught or they died from disease, so uh, another unknown and huge fact. But they have to make a decision. Are they going to go or are they not going to go? So how are they going to do this? Maybe they're going to call a meeting like this. Okay, all the slaves on Washington's plantation at 5 o'clock, uh, let's get together and we're going to decide. We're going to have a rally. 
Now, it doesn't work like that. There's slave informers everywhere. This is dangerous business. We're talking about undercover, clandestine operations. So we know it has to have been because there were slaves that were turned in. They have to have done it this way. So they're having these meetings. They have to be in small groups. They're making these, these, these uh, decisions. Shall we run? Shall we not? So they're evaluating if we run, what's going to happen if we get caught? What's going to happen once we get there? Um, if we don't run, what happens if the British then conquer the plantation? We're going to be sold into slavery and go to the West Indies. They're trying to figure all this out. They're trying to weigh the dangers and the prospects. They have to be doing this. We, don't, we have no records of the journals, okay? but we know they have to be doing this. So I include that in the story. It has to be. Uh, I call this situational reconstruction. I don't, by the way, call that in this book. That's a fancy word for Harvard, but situational reconstruction. Uh, in the book, I just talk about the kind of deliberations that they must be making. Because all I'm doing is I'm putting myself in their position and trying to evaluate their hypothetical uh, prospects. Now, this is a, there's a movement in history which does exactly this. If you look into the, what's being done in, say, diplomatic history now, you'll see people say, you can't just look at history as a train leading up to the present. You know, everything has a neat conclusion to, uh, you know, cause and effect to something else. That's, that's, that, that's too... Uh, one-dimensional, and it, history doesn't work like that. At every point, there's choices, and that's what history is about, is those choices and why they make those choices. So to make those choices, you have to go back to the times and try to evaluate the prospects, and that's how you really get to learn about how the people are experiencing those times. This is done in, in all, you know, sort of political history. What I'm suggesting is we take this kind of sophisticated and very, very obvious approach all the way down to common people, do the full version. When we do this, we find all the people are making, all the people throughout the revolutionary era are making very willed and conscious uh, choices about how to participate in political action. You have Andrew Gearing, the, uh, a pacifist. Uh, he's in jail because he won't take the oath. His minister is telling him, is saying, you're great, Andrew, because you're really true to your beliefs, so stay in jail. And his wife is telling him, it's August, the crops are in, if you don't get, do whatever you have to do to get out of jail, we starve. You know, he's making a decision. He's trying to figure that out. You have Joseph Plum Martin, uh, one of my five principal soldiers here, talking in very moving terms about his decision, shall he join the mutiny or not? He's patriotic. He believes in his cause. He's suffered all this time, and, he, and, and yet all the people are... So he doesn't want to go against his army, against his leaders, but they haven't been paid, and they're starving. Does he mutiny or not? You have Corn Planter, the, Corn Planter, the Iroquois warrior, he captures his own father, because his father is an Irishman, as it turns out, John O'Bale. And he captures him. What am he, what's he going to do with his own father when he captures him on the other side? You have a, another Iroquois captures his brother, who's also fighting on the other side. This is really a civil war. This is happening all over the place. What are these people going to do? How are they, they going to deal with these kinds of uh, decisions? You have, this is a very moving one, several cases. You have questions of soldiers, the, uh, whites and also some Indian soldiers, coming acro across an unarmed man, you know, and he's got the bead on him. He's pointing the rifle, and he has to decide whether to shoot the trigger, pull the trigger on a guy who he knows is going to die, you know, that direct. And these guys, for years later, they're, they, this is haunting them, okay? This is a view of war. This isn't the view of war that we get, you know, when we just kind of read the revolution. It's not the rah-rah view. These people are making choices. They are political actors. Uh, and their, their, their actions are the revolution. There's some total of actions. To get the full story, that's what we have to do. We have to study how all these people are navigating the troubled waters of revolution, seeking their own freedoms in their own multivarious ways. Okay? When we do this, what we do is we go beyond the simplistic morality tale, which is the usual revolution, good and bad, and of course we're the good, and we go and we arrive at a much, a much more complex and intriguing and really humanly full picture, something we can really identify with, much more indicative of the true diversity that we're seeking today in our, for our nation's identity, and also as individuals. So this is it. Um, this is a people's history, and uh, I've done what I could do. Uh, people's history, I think, you know, I'm to show you the book, I think, because, you know. Uh, I'm kinda, actually, I'm kind of proud of it. I think uh, the New Press is, has done a great job uh, with this book. And uh, I'm totally thrilled to be involved with Howard on the project. And if you're into this thing, this people's history, okay, uh, you have partly Howard to thank and also Mark Favreau, who's, uh, where is Mark? Is he around here? Stand up, Mark, uh, wherever you are. Where are you? Are you here? Come on, stand up. Give it to, <laughs> Mark is my editor at New Press. All the way up, Mark. I have a reason for this. Come on. All the way up. Okay. 
So I want you guys to recognize Mark, and, the, and, this, and here's, my, here's the reason in my madness here, because he's kind of embarrassed because he didn't know I was going to do this. My reason is, is this is a people's history series, and, and we're really into input as to what that series could be, what, you know, further books, further ideas for the whole, the whole business. So uh, it's an open-ended thing. Howard's working on the series with Mark, and I'm just kind of like hanging out and giving my two cents. So other people who have, you know, two cents to give, uh, feel free. We hope the series is going to uh, really help to, to push the study of history forward. Thanks. And uh, I think what's happening now, maybe some people are probably need to leave if you do, do. Uh, but we're going to stay for about 15 more minutes, and, and Howard and I would love to have questions and engage in some dialogue. Okay. If, if you'll please uh, use the microphone, that would be very helpful. If it's too hard, the camera's busy. Um, so do we have... Craig, can you take one of the... I think they, they, they look good on you. They, they, they. What's that? Uh, okay. Um, the, is, do, do we have people waiting at a mic here? Okay. Okay. Um, what I like to know is how are we going to get this stuff into the schools? Uh, thank you very much. Um, are you a plant? Did I tell you to say that? <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a mother with kids in school. Excellent. Even better. <laughs> okay. Boston uh, Public Schools. That's <laughs> right. Good. Excellent question. This. This really is intended uh, for use in, in that direction. Um, a couple of steps. First of all, I did prepare a teacher's guide to this. Questions from all the way from the kind of simple comprehension questions to very complex critical thinking questions involving the footnotes. I mean, I have a thousand footnotes in here to, to referencing all the original sources and pointing people in those directions and even inviting people to challenge my s statements and so on. So we have that, and that will be available shortly. Um, and then we're also going to work on, you know, there's a question of how these things are going to sort of get by the local school boards, which are written, you know, the standards seem to be written more for a traditional form of history. So I'm going to try to prepare, and uh, working with the national standards, a sort of master little sheet which will be available, you know, through with the, uh, uh, just request it and give me a couple of months to, for the thing to come out, and uh, with the teacher's edition showing how this fits in with the national standards. Uh, so you can in the actually have some ammunition to try to get it into your schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do we work this? Just let me add something to that. Um, I, I ran into this problem you know, when People's History of the United States came out. The problem was you know, how to get it into the schools when the principal and the and the school board and uh, maybe the chair of the department uh, of the school won't like it. Uh, and one thing that people did is they simply photocopied parts of the book. And, uh, and so long as we're free and easy, Mark Fevreau, you won't mind, <laughs> the <laughs> new press. No, but really, uh, very often that's the only thing you can do. Uh, I mean, where you can get it approved officially, great, you know. And what happens is there's a progression where people, s this is what I found with the book. At first, you know, there's surreptitious uh, photocopied chapters handed out to students alongside the regular text. And then as, you know, the, it, the idea began to seep into the consciousness of the educational uh, world and become more respectable, then after a while, yeah, adoptions and, and approvals and so on. So, uh, I mean, I don't know how legal this is, but, uh, <laughs> but we don't care. <laughs> Let me say also about schools, th th this is written for, a, um, uh, for just a, uh, an audience, that any, you know, high school or college or general trade audience, uh, but hopefully it would be available for lower um, the stories in it can be extracted. This is apropos of the Xeroxing. So in other words, a teacher could take this and where the teacher's guide certainly develop all sorts of lesson plans with this material. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I was in Binghamton, New York recently, and uh, in the newspaper I read a controversy regarding an Indian Holocaust memorial. I wonder if you're familiar with this. Apparently, Je George Washington ordered the Indians in that region around Binghamton, <coughs> he ordered General Sheridan, I guess, to eradicate the Indians, men, women, and children, including their villages, and I, I, and I looked up a little bit about this, and apparently this did happen. Washington gave the order, and the Indians really were, many of them killed, and the rest were moved to, uh, or moved themselves to Niagara. I wondered if, I never heard this before, and I was amazed. It appears to be true. Are you familiar with this? If the, it's true, why haven't we heard about this in history before? There was a major, major campaign um, against the Iroquois in, by General Sullivan, and actually a lot of his, a lot of his uh, officers kept journals, and the journals were fascinating because they were like the body counts, you know, uh, for the Vietnam War. And this except, was on direct order from George Oh, yeah, Washington. oh, yeah, direct order. And, and except they were vegetable counts because this was, a, was the, the idea was to starve them. So they, they, the orders were to burn every piece of everything that was growing. It was a certain, you know, it was that defoliation, early version of defoliation. So they did this. They burned all the Indian fields uh, throughout, uh, throughout New York. And of course, the following winter was a very hard one and great starvation. And it did absolutely zero to stop the Indian raids because what was the people who had survived were the warriors, and they were furious. So next year, of course, was much worse along the frontier. Uh, but that's what it was. It was, it was re really a genocidal type of operation. And you're, and you're right. It, it's, it's, covered, uh, it's, it's covered in the book, and then there are references where you can actually go back to the original sources written by, once, once again, reflected images. Because the Indians, actually, there's some of this. There is a captured Indian. Mary Jameson was captured when she was a child and became, she married an Iroquois warrior, and she wrote something. And she wrote about the starvation that followed, and that's in here. And then you can read actually the accounts of the officers themselves as well about this. You can this. get the order from Washington in his, what is it, uh, 1931, there's a 13 volume biography. Uh, you're fr probably familiar with that. That's the Fitz yeah, the Fitzgerald. They, they, there's, yeah. um, gives, his, the, gives the order, right. and you, right. you can look up General, right. whatever you. it is, right. Sullivan's journals yeah. too, and see That's his right. rec record. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I just had a couple comments, mainly on uh, Dr. Zinn's uh, speech. Uh, I mean, I, I think. I, I like the part you talked about how the U.S. has a history of, uh, of uh, class oppression and, and racism and, and racial exploitation, uh, a history just, you know, like Harvard also has a history of class exploitation and, and class oppression. And you also made the connection which about what to, that you have to use the study of history in terms of what to do to get rid of this. So I just wanted to address what I think needs to be done about to get rid of class exploitation, to get rid of class oppression. And uh, I'm, I'm a Marxist, I'm a follower of the Spartacist League. We put out the paper of Workers' Vanguard. And we think that in order to get rid of racism, get rid of racial oppression, there has to be, if you will, the history of a bottom, a making of the history through the bottom up in the same way the Bolsheviks made history in the bottom up, which is to put the working class in power uh, through a third American revolution, just like the Civil War uh, smashed slavery. We think there needs to be a revolution to smash uh, class slavery, smash wage slavery. And so I just wanted to encourage everybody to check out our paper, Workers' Vanguard, and also to read Marx, which I think explains the history of capitalism. Howard, do you want to comment? I, I don't think I need to comment. Because uh, it's not really a question, right? It's a, it's a manifesto, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, you know, uh, do we need revolutions from below? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, that's a, what kind of revolutions, how, when, well, that, you know, that's very complicated. Um, but uh, anyway, it's, uh, you know, a, a welcome point of view. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for your comments. Um, one of the things I think is that most of our traditional histories tend to skew heavily towards elite-driven histories, as you both discussed today. And the revolution is certainly a great example of that. And some of those reasons for it are contemporary. And some of them are interposed. And uh, David Hackett Fisher in Paul Revere's Ride gives us a good account of how the Lexington Alarm, which had dozens and dozens and dozens of artisans involved with, became transposed by Longfellow because of Civil War propaganda into a single rider, a lone voice in the night. Right. Some of the reasons why we have an elite history of the revolution, I think, 
were contemporaneous with the revolution itself. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you might want to comment on what were some of those reasons for burnishing the elites? What was the perception of the elites at the time and reasons for, if, if you look at Adams and Jefferson, they're, they're self-conscious of their place in history. And in most of the, quote, founding fathers' writings, they're speaking to posterity. Mm -hmm. What do you see as being some of the reasons for their own skewing history in favor of? Well, they had a very difficult job because they wanted something that was called a revolution, but obviously they didn't want revolution. So, you know, they had a hard, it's a hard balancing act, and they wanted to basically ally themselves with people who did want a revolution and then quickly distance themselves from that same, from those same people. And, uh, you know, it's a complex way in which we did, in which they did this. And um, that's all I can say. Uh, they sort of managed to pull it off, which was, uh, anyway, that's, uh, I guess it's to their credit, but, uh, but it was, it was, you know, after the revolution, there was an attempt at another revolution. Let me just, uh, speaking of Shays' Rebellion, which, which Howard mentioned, remember I mentioned uh, the 1774 revolution, which was the revolution, it was the, the real overthrow of the government throughout all of Massachusetts? That was in 1774. In 1786, exactly 12 years later to the day, actually one day less, because like in Springfield it was August 30th and 12 years later it was August 29th because the way the courts were meeting, the exact same people showed up, but not quite as many of them, and tried to do the exact same thing. They tried to engage in a second revolution. This is something in the terms of the history of Shays' Rebellion, it's just, it's never fully understood because people don't understand the context that these guys were just trying to do a repeat performance. And the iron, you know, this, the, 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 the result was the first one succeeded and the second one failed. And that's sort of how you can mark what happened uh, after the revolution. That was the mark that, uh, that the revolution was not going to, the second revolution, the full social revolution was not going to succeed. That, 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 there's a lot more to, to, to speak about that. I'm glad you raised the issue, but, you know, I mean, that's a huge issue. Yeah. Let me just say one more thing about that, and that is that there's this continuity, you know, that Ray is talking about, you know, from 1774, 1786, and of course before 1774 and after 1786, but in the midst of the revolution, in the midst of the war against England, which presumably is, you know, as uh, Ray said, you know, the story is of the United Colonists, Patriotic War, and so on. But in the midst of that, there are mutinies, uh, which are class-based. That is, uh, the, the soldiers, the privates, uh, are being uh, treated like dirt. The officers are being treated like kings. And, uh, you know, they're getting uh, high pay and good clothes and good food and they're having parties and so on. And, and, the, and the pirates are uh, uh, not giving any clothes, not getting any pay, and are being kept in when they want to be mustered out. Their time of service is up. And so they mutiny in 1781. There are a number. In 1781, there are the mutiny of thousands of soldiers in the Pennsylvania line, and Washington has to be very careful in dealing with that because there are thousands of them, and he's worried and expresses this, that this, is, this may spread to the whole revolutionary army. Uh, and so he deals with them by compromising. But then shortly after that, there's a, another mutiny in the New Jersey line where only a few hundred mutineers are involved. And at that point, Washington gets tough. And, you know, th there's this romanticized picture of Washington which, uh, well, as we see, uh, is dispelled when you look at how he treats black people and how he treats Indians, but also how he treats presumably his own, his own soldiers. When, they, when he feels he can handle the mutiny in the New Jersey line, his orders are shoot them. And so they take out, so it, by random, actually, it's almost the, like the movie Paths of Glory, where they you know, pick out at random you know, the troublemakers. At random, they pick them out, and they have them executed by their fellow mutineers. Yeah. Um, I, I think sometimes it's hard for uh, people, whether historians or just students in school, to uh, pursue lines of thought that go against what the mainstream is telling them is the right thing to believe and what is oftentimes the more easy thing to believe. And, and I've read uh, a couple of Mr. Uh, Zinn's books and I, I feel like I have a, somewhat of an idea about how that process occurred in his life, but I was just curious about when you uh, made the decision. You mentioned earlier, I don't know jokingly or not, about being in a school of 
people's historians, how do you get to that place? You know, it's not like your education probably led you to that early on. W what makes you follow that path? Uh, I'm going to give you sort of an academic version and a political and a uh, um, political activist version. The academic one is actually when I first uh, ran into in the uh, in um, when I was in high school and I ran into a st uh, one of these collections of slave narratives, you know, from the WPA projects and the B. A. Botkin laid my burden down. It was a collection of those where the writers went down and collected all the narratives. I could not believe I was reading these, you know, first-hand accounts from slaves. I was so struck by this. I mean, it, I don't know, it hit me deeply. The other one is an act activist and really got me into the, the power of uh, people's history was Howard Zinn. And Howard Zinn, he doesn't know this. I was about to tell him this story uh, this afternoon and we ran out of time, so I'm telling it to you now. Yeah, please. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know, because you've been... <laughs> You, we've been waiting all this time, right? That's uh, that's why he's that's, sitting that's there. He's still I've waiting. waiting I know, right? Uh, so here's what happened. Uh, I'm in the South in, in 1964, working with SNCC. I was just a volunteer, and um, and meanwhile, and this is a this is a big year. You know, it's where the people are murdered and everything, and there's bombings and all this is going on. And and then we're preparing for the Mississippi uh, Freedom Democratic Party to go to the convention to challenge. So. Um, Anyway, meanwhile, what, what's in the press is usual, uh, still is all this stuff about Martin Luther King and the, and the established leadership. And what I'm seeing on the ground is this incredible, I mean, these people who work with SNCC, I couldn't believe them. I couldn't believe them. I was just awed. I was like floored. I mean, this was like, I don't know, um, to see their commitment and the, the dangers they faced every day in their life force and their vitality. And then, right then, Howard Zinn comes out with a book called SNCC, The New Abolitionist. And it's amazing. It gets the story absolutely right. And I had never, I'd been in the movement for a while at this time, and every time you're in the movement, you go to a demonstration, then you read about it in the paper the next day. You know, what? That wasn't the demonstration I was at. And here there's a political event, and I'm seeing, and he's writing about it from the bottom up. And this was before that, that term bottom up had even been coined, and he's doing it. And that really impacted me that that could be done. Uh, you know, so indirectly, most people here are kind of affected by by the people's history, and I, you know, I guess we shared enough in common that uh, we go about that far back. So, okay. <laughs> so Howard is no Johnny come lately to this movement. <laughs> Uh, I was fascinated by um, what you were saying about the Indians and enslaved um, blacks running to the British Army. Um, could you speculate um, whether they would have been better off um, if the, the, the British, you know, had in fact prevailed? If the British had prevailed? Yeah. What, once they ran to the Army, they didn't uh, really... At the, there's two stages. The early part of the war where they were actually technically offered their freedom and a few received it, uh, but not that many. And then later in the war where they went by the droves, that's where the tens of thousands went. And, and th at this time, the, it was just sort of an implicit thing, maybe you'll get free, and they weren't. Basically what happened, they would become servants of officers, they would be placed in very hard labor situations. Some of them would actually be taken off as slaves by, uh, by loyalists. Um, so very few really, uh, out of, of, out of may, uh, approximately 80,000 slaves that ran to the British for their freedom, 3,000 exactly received their freedom. And I say that is the number of slaves that were uh, recorded as, as, as being taken to Canada, um, you know, for the, you know, as, as free slaves after the war. Now, um, it's hard to say what would have happened. It, what did happen is the revolution for the institution of slavery tended to rigidify that institution because before the revolution, the institution of slavery hadn't really been challenged, and this did challenge it, and that caused the slave owners to create a kind of reaction. Uh, and so a lot of the tale of the revolution for its slaves is increasing reaction at home. Momentary kind of freedom. Some of these people actually, there were maroon communities where they actually were free for a while, so there was kind of a momentary taste of freedom, and then after war, Lamp down totally. That's where you get the rigidified slave codes. They came right in the wake of the revolution. Um, I really am. I'm enjoying uh, this session, and particularly what the questions that came out, because that made concrete some of the implications for doing a new social history, with uh, looking at it 
more, in a more comprehensive, holistic way. Uh, one of the things uh, that I wonder, and I'm going to get your book to, to see it, to what extent can we spell out and make obvious how our understanding of where we are today is changed and different because of what we now know about what happened then? Now listen, we know that it was complicated. There were many different uh, groups with different particular perspectives and issues. It wasn't organized and, and integrated as, as it seems in retrospect. The future always looks uncertain. The past looks like it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. So the question is, when, when we do these kinds of histories, is it clear that we try to spell out how our understanding is now different and more adequate to the outcome that, that we saw in the more limited histories from top down? In your book, you try to show how our understanding mm -hmm. about the, the American Revolution is either uh, deepened or in some way changed, number one. Number two, are there lessons, mm -hmm. when you look at that at this period, yeah. are there lessons we can draw for today, okay. just yeah. as we used today to yeah. do that? Well, remember I said at the beginning that when we learn, hi history is how we learn the grammar of the political process. You know, that's how we learn to interpret the political process. So when, and I use that in a negative way because when we learn the elite history, that's what we're learning. So you can just take the converse of that to answer your question. If you learn the history, if, if, if you growing up, you learn that people are proactive, that people gather together, that in, in a real, in a, what democracy means is not voting, or it's a lot more than voting. It's people gathering together uh, for their own uh, interests and standing up for their interests and so on. You take that kind of image of that's you know that grammar and, and translate it to the present. Presumably, uh, you will make that a much more uh, normal or accepted or integral part of contemporary society. These things aren't, and it's no accident really that this kind of history is coming out today. I mean, this history really is, in a sense, it coming. It's flowing directly from the 1960s. Uh, the the historians that 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 are really. I mean, a lot of this is based on on you know, historical research which has come directly out of the, uh, the 1960s uh, by a, a great wave of new social history. Uh, just to read one little example of your book in your teaching career, I had an opportunity to learn about uh, American w economic and social history. Uh, and uh, I use Lowell as an example. I learned from my colleague who taught a course in an interdisciplinary fashion. And I understood much more deeply how the feminist movement over the course of our history right. developed. Yeah. The unintended consequence of the Industrial mm -hmm. Revolution and getting mm -hmm. cheap farm girls mm -hmm. to come in was in the course of, the, of learning disciplined work and organization being educated by people like Thoreau in order to please their fathers. They had a special educational program. And then when uh, there was a cutback in work because the, uh, the merchant princes who couldn't uh, sell, uh, apply the trade to uh, China, uh, had an opportunity to invest in, uh, in developing uh, uh, textile industries, mm -hmm. overbuilt, mm -hmm. they cut their wages to these women. And the, the women then organized, as many of us know, and it shows how the nature of life itself, as mm -hmm. partly predicted by Karl mm -hmm. Marx, the actual experience of organization transforms people and develops leadership for the next several generations, okay. women who were active in the feminist movement and in the abolitionist movement and the like. So I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. important uh, observations we can, can make right. and lessons yeah, thanks. For, for today. Right. By right, and the message is that if we do this with any particular period or subject in history, if you take that attitude, you're going to wind up with that kind of uh, impact on contemporary consciousness. Uh, Thank you. Right. Examining up right, yeah. We, we're told we have three more questions, these three people, so. That we we are told that uh, anonymous, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I just like to commend you both because not only does your work bring more perspective, but it brings passion to education. So thank you. Thank you. A reminder that you can use C-SPAN video in your.